right, let's open the uh, November 20th, uh, 2024 uh, meeting of the Multiply Roxbury Board of School Directors. Uh, first order of business is public comment. Uh, public comment is an opportunity for the public to uh, bring issues or concerns to the attention of the board. Uh, it is a listening time for the board. That does not mean that we are not taking the concerns seriously and that we uh, are not um, going to, to look into them and um, take possible follow-up action. Uh, but if we sit here and do not respond, that is because that is what the time is for. It's for you, you to talk and for us to listen. Um, and uh, also, if uh, oral public comment is um, not your preferred way to give comment. It can be uh, a little feel a little on the spot, which we try not to make you do, but I, I know the public speaking is not everyone's favorite thing. Uh, please feel free to email us anytime at schoolboard at m m mpsdt.org. Um, so with that, uh, any public comment in the room? Yes. And please come up to the, yeah, so they can, the folks back home can can hear you well. Uh, yeah, and, and introduce yourself. Okay. I'm primarily interested in looking at the time frames. Um, so I mean, you can look at these and the text that goes with them. And we can, if, yeah, we can see it from there. Oh, no. That if you could sit at the chair, because yeah, that mic's going to pick you up. Okay. Lady, I'm just saying, yeah, thank you. Uh, okay, Connie, I'm just you? Yeah, thank you. Okay, well, good evening. Okay, this I'm presenting to you as um, to encourage you to think about the choice that we have, one of the choices that we have in front of us right now, and how important it is to be quick in deciding this, otherwise the opportunity may go away. Okay, dear com school committee members, Given the limited time, we have to address two urgent requests from nearby children's programs seeking additional classroom space to enable them to expand their capacity by bringing additional educational programs to the area. We must act quickly. They are each well-run, high-quality programs needing your endorsement to move forward in securing a space at Roxbury Village School. We're all aware that there are few existing full day childcare programs and special focus elementary programs in Vermont, and that all of them have a very long waiting list for enrollment, limiting a parent's ability to work outside the home. This is our chance to address the serious lack of full day childcare, as well as meeting the needs of families desiring full-day nature-based programs for their children. As educators entrusted with the responsibility for providing high-quality educational opportunities for the children of the community, we can together maximize the availability of these learning environments by choosing to be leaders in supporting programs that support our community's children and young families. We are requesting your urgent approval of these two programs as tenants. This is your chance to take advantage of this unique request and opportunity to wisely endorse quality education and meet the current specialized needs by defining terms for the rental of the space at RVS by a preschool, Little Sunshine Child Care Inc. and a Vermont Farm and Forest School a nature-based elementary program. We look forward to receiving word of your approval for renting space to these two programs 
in the next two weeks. So we won't all miss the chance to grow the educational possibilities in the area through rental income. But so many families and children in our community. You'll find the attached chart indicating the rooms to be rented to each of these schools. All the classrooms meet age appropriate licensing square footage and exit requirements for space. Individual programs can provide tuition data, enrollment expectations, staff credentials, insurance agreements, and any special needs for their classroom spaces. They've each sent you letters describing their programs and requesting the conditions you would require from renters. Your approval of these requests will allow the process of resolving an empty building's reuse for Roxbury residents to move forward. There is no reason to ignore two possible rentals, ASAP. Please move to a quick decision to conclude the stress of the past year. Thank you. Hey guys. Jacqueline Frazier, the usual suspects here from Roxbury. Um, speaking to the school in the building, we have a few people who want to speak tonight. Mine is just my personal experience, which has so far been pretty incredible. Um, as a single parent, the after school program has been extremely helpful. The extra half an hour is gold um, to 5.30 and just the flexibility it has offered me um, has allowed me to pursue a full-time job finally um, because I've been the sole caregiver. Um, so now that I have this good coverage and which was there before, but it's been really specifically helpful. The busing has been a bit messy, but everything else has kind of worked together to come together. And Casey just continues to run a rock star program. And the kids are looking forward to all of the projects they get to do um, and their continued after school learning um, and their social emotional well-being with their community, which is a new community, but an old community for me. So it's been really wonderful. And we're um, hoping to be able to continue that if given the option. Um, I think my daughter would like to say something. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll jump in. Um, for the warm up acts for the real stars back here. Um, it's nice to see all of you again. Thank you. I also came to speak to Bridges tonight and just really wanting to advocate and provide some perspective um, on how incredible this program is. I really. You know, my family has experienced four other reputable after school programs in other districts, other states. I thought I knew what after school programming could look like. And then I experienced Bridges. And Bridges is just a category of its own. It's not childcare. This is not a club that supports hobbies and playing games. Those are great. They have a place, but Bridges is an extension of high quality academic programming. It's building on and going far beyond what the students are learning in the classrooms. Every session is offering multiple focuses. Kids sign up for a preferred topic. They attend that topic specific class every single week for four to six week sessions. The classes are supported by experts in their fields. And like the most inspiring classes we have at school, every session is culminating in a final project or a product that students can share with their community and with their families. In the past year, these sessions have included a phenomenal play for which the students wrote the script, they acted all the parts, they built scenery, they helped design the costumes, they did the advertising. A professional clown came every week to teach our student clowns tricks. The director of Circus Smirkus visited as a creative consultant, Professional singers and designers mentored the student playwrights and parent volunteers sewed their costumes. The result was a high quality performance that was comparable to the most expensive theater camps that we have in the state. And yet this one benefited all students, regardless of income. My own child who doesn't consider themselves a performer and would never attend a theater class or camp felt safe stepping out of their comfort zone and was able to be one of the lead actors because they were 
had relationships and their bridges leaders could kind of coax them out of their shell and they had a co supportive community where they felt safe really going out of their out of their wheelhouse so this session i've been working um every week with the architecture and engineering course it is unbelievable what these kids are doing they started the session by designing and building containers to pad their eggs through all sorts of drops and impacts and then they had a competition which i remember vividly doing in eighth grade it is a core memory, and I think it's part of what led me toward my profession. So the fact that these guys are getting to do it in second and third and fourth grade is just so special and influential. Another day, we learned how to design floor plans. We used scales and professional graphic symbols, and each of them drew their dream forts. And they brought their biggest, best ideas and designed spaces to accommodate trampolines and gondolas and trapdoors and homes for their pet rabbits. So they've been engineering and constructing and testing bridges built out of pasta. They've experimented with set design, crafting masks and backdrops and 3D photo booths for a recent community celebration. And they're being exposed to so many high level academic experiences and future professional paths at such young ages. And it's wild just to see their minds grow every day. You can see them visualizing a bigger future for themselves and so many different ideas of who they are and what excites them and inspires them. And I know this is benefiting them. I hear about it from their teachers at school. Their teachers in the classroom are benefiting from them getting this extra enrichment. And it's, but it's also really gonna feed their ideas of who they can be after graduation and the paths that they can take from this small town. So to the Montpelier families listening, I do wanna remind you that this program is available to all kindergarten through sixth graders in this district. It's housed in the former Roxbury School, but it's not exclusive to Roxbury students. We have homeschool students and students from the Mad River Valley and other surrounding communities who are driving in to attend this program because it's so excellent. Um, the Bridges program this right now has more students enrolled and attending each week than we had in the entire school last year. So just sit on that one for a second. Like every student practically from the school and more are coming back each week to our program. While the current budget issue is a significant priority and I don't take it lightly, this board and this district administration is also responsible for holding a vision for the future of our district. And as funds become increasingly tight for in-school resources, please consider these unquantifiable cost savings to the district from programs like Bridges. It offers students deep senses of belonging. It extends their social emotional learning that is a core to our MRPS goals. And it builds on the academic learning that is happening in the classroom. These are very expensive benefits that are being provided at a steep discount due to this extensive network of unpaid volunteers who co-lead and support the program, parents serving as assistant teachers, and the network of incredible professional resources that Casey is able to draw from. Last year, the Bridges program was run five days a week for a total cost of less than $105,000. This is 0.003% of the district's $31 million budget. It would be short-sighted for this board to stop funding one of the most successful programs in the district, particularly one that is critical to some of the most vulnerable kids in the district who really require the ongoing support from their community to successfully adapt to the upheaval of having their school closed. I encourage you to look to the Bridges model as one that can be expanded upon and replicated across all grades at this district to provide more academic supports, more career exposure, and stronger social emotional foundations into the future to benefit all the kids in this district. Thank you very much. I'll pass these here. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Great. Thanks, Hannah. Anyone else? Um, I'm Jenny Bartlett Hardy. Um, I'm a year round admin assistant at Main Street Middle School, and I'm also the co chair of the Ashme Union. I hope that this evening I can give you all a glimpse of who we are and what our union is and the importance of that um, before 
decisions are made before cutting um, the budget. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar, the Ashme Union um, is made up of year round in school year support staff, currently consisting of two head custodians um, with one position at the high school that's been open for quite some time, um, nine custodians with ongoing openings throughout the district, and nine admin assistants some of which are registrars, um, and four technology specialists. It's a small group of just 24 professionals with strategically assigned roles within each school in the district with minimal crossover in responsibilities and redundancies. We may not always be the ones working directly with the students, but we are often reminded of that we are the backbone of the district. Admin assistants, primarily, um, primary responsibilities, to name a few, are managing attendance, assigning substitutes, enrolling students, programming schedules, family communications, ordering, and financing. They are also expected to know the ins and outs of the daily routines and the needs of the admin, staff, students, and faculty. They're the first to greet new and returning families and community, community members, and they are consistently the same person who greets students daily, assisting them in navigating their school day. The custodians and head custodians in the MRPS district are rare finds. They take time to build relationships with school communities and with students. In addition, they are dedicated to ensuring the safety of our students, staff, and faculty they often cannot complete all of their tasks with, within their assigned 40 hour week. And they also make themselves available on weekends for overtime for student and community events that take place within the schools. Very few, very, very few individuals could perform these duties at such a caring level as we see in our districts. Our four tech specialists work to ensure that students receive the devices and programs they need to be successful and that our teachers have up-to-date tech they require to teach the students daily. They are responsible for researching, implementing ways to protect the district and student information from data breaches. If you've ever worked in a school system when the internet goes down or the network goes down, you'd know the purpose of having important and capable technology specialists available. When forces are reduced without understanding why each position is crucial to the school, there are repercussions. The responsibilities of those being cut still need to be completed. Those responsibilities will shift to those who remain and already have an abundance of work that sometimes fills more than 40 hours a week. This affects everyone from school communities to families, faculty, admin, and ultimately the students. Burnout of staff leads to revolving door of new employees coming through the doors, quality and quali quantity of work that can be completed, and the relationships formed with families and students. We're asking the board to be well informed by those working in the positions of the, those being considered for elimination. The current support staff positions exist for a reason. There must be enough support staff to brace the already top heavy system. Thank you. Good evening. Tom Frazier from Rock 3. I'm here to talk about the uh, the final report of the Committee for the Future of the RVS Building. Um, it's the 800 pound gorilla in the room tonight. We all know and have heard how great the after school program is. We hope that in your wisdom, you'll continue that program no matter what scenario the building carries on with the building. Um, Judy Lusk and I started this ad hoc committee back in August, I think it was, when there really wasn't any 
any information out there about what was going on with the school. I mean, I knew now after I thought about it for a while back in 22 that this was going to happen because in July of 22 is when we lost our vote and it became the vote of the board to close our school. So you haven't really closed the school. You voted to take the kids away. You didn't even need a Pied Piper. You just voted. So we're left with a decision on, in the town as to what to do with the building. We looked at a lot of different scenarios and really what it comes down to is that we, we want to get the building back as soon as possible. Because as Mia said in one meeting, I was at she and Libby, when you use words like foreseeable, they really don't mean anything. Foreseeable can be till next week or next year. And the town of Roxbury needs some certainty. We have before us, that Dottie has presented, um, options to rent the entire building at this point so that it will be supported and not be a burden on the town. Because contrary to what, you know, some of the speakers from Montpelier have said, in a very condescending fashion, that you are giving us a community building. Well, it's like giving somebody the flu because it comes at a terrible cost. And we, as we're just as overtaxed as you are in Montpelier. And to take on not only our normal school tax, but then to take on the support of this building, which is another would add another six plus cents to our tax rate. You don't, you know, for some reason that just escapes everybody. Oh, we're just going to get the building back. And it's not going to cost anything. You're just going to have it as a community space. You know? Well, that isn't the case. And through our work and some very lucky circumstances, people have come forward to make use of the space. Farm and Forest School is interested in three rooms plus an office. Roxbury Roots is interested in the kitchen plus the nurse's room. They would expand or connect the two. Um, the little sunshine outfit from Randolph is interested in two rooms for for uh, child care. The uh, what's the other one? I can't think. Well, in th two individuals want to rent offices, so we we have taken we've done our homework, and now we need you guys to get off dead center, and make a decision. Now, I know the school board or the select board has had some communication with, with the board. Um, I don't know what that is. Somehow it seems to be, well, you guys know about executive sessions. So um, a lot of what they've talked about has been an executive session. But the most important thing I think for people to realize is that the town of Roxbury needs certainty. And if you put this off turning this back to the town of Roxbury. We have no idea what the voters in Montpelier are going to do. So that just puts us off another year. You know, they may turn down your your vote, your your uh, budget, and the first thing you'll do is cut the $175,000 to run this the after school program. So what we need is to take the building back and finance the building ourselves and then have you run the after-school program for the benefit of the students. There's no equity for our kids in what you've done. You've taken them out of their community and put them in a community that they and their parents had no choice, no say in at all. And you've done it in, in a way, you've addressed it as though, oh, it's the best thing for your kids. They'll get a much better education at UES. Well, I've read the UES climate report, and that's not the case. That is not the case. Now, our kids are doing fine. Kids are resilient. They'll do well. What I'm worried about is the town. The town, the school, you guys have all been there. It's, it's the center of our community. Has been for the last 30, 40 years, whatever. 
and well, 200 years. But as it's, its present configuration, it's been there for 40 years. Um, it has our town hall. It has our uh, potentially town water and sewer system in place. We have to take the building back. We don't have any choice for those two reasons. But the most important thing is that we get that decision made so that we can move forward. This business of being hung out to dry constantly has to stop. And I think the most important thing to move it forward is for you to make a decision tonight to turn this building back to Roxbury before town meeting day or based on, a, because as I understand from the last select board meeting, it's not an issue of the town vote. The select board can just take it back because the, the $1 business was already decided in the merger vote. So it can be a, a decision of the select board. Um, then of course, town meeting, well, they'll have to put a budget item in to, to f uh, fund the building. So there, there is gonna have to be a vote. There are a lot of details that have to be worked out, but I just want this board to get off dead center and stop dragging us through the dirt. I mean, it's, it, this has been going on. You had the busing situation, you know, uh, kids, have, kids are doing fine. Kids are resilient. They'll always do fine. It's the rest of us that have the problem. And the town has a, a serious problem if they have to, you know, wait another year and we lose all these rental options, then where are we going to be? And, you know, the only way forward for, for you, if you hold on to it for another year, is if you make um, contracts with these people who want to rent space in the building. And, you know, I certainly don't see anybody jumping forward to do that. So I think you need to just, you know, tear the Band-Aid off. Let us have the building back. Let us go forward and fill the building with kids. That's really what it, what the townspeople want. So hopefully you're going to make a decision tonight and hopefully it'll be to immediately work out an arrangement with the select board to, to send the building back to Roxbury. Then you'll be done with it. You won't have to worry about it. You won't have to hear Tina Muncy come in here and tell you how great it is that we're given, you guys are giving us the building. You know, thank you. Is it something? It's an age. <laughs> I think this sh the school should be open because people learn a lot of stuff there and we all get to have fun and be friends and all of us don't get to see each other that much because all of us are in separate classes and we get to hang out with our friends there. And it's a community school and we like to hang out with each other. That was very well Thank said. You. Wait, before you leave, before you leave, can you say your name into the mic for us? Can you come say your name in the mic? True public commenter. Teddy. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Teddy. <laughs> I'll be real quick here. Judy Lusk. Um, I was the co-chair with Tom. Um, I just want to express that on Monday night at our select board meeting, we had a lot of young community members coming and acting very excited about the prospect of getting our building back and about the layout that we have here and what the building could be and what our community could be. And I just implore you to please act as soon as possible and work with our select board to set a date to make this happen. Thank you. Anyone else in the room? Yes. I'm Hazel Bryan, and at Bridges, is, is some of the 
some of the rare time that all the kids get to hang out together. At UES, it is usually boys versus girls, but at Bridges, we work together boys and girls. Bridges is also a way to interact with our community and friends. And we see our beloved teacher, Casey. At Bridges, we do a lot of things, including making pods for eggs and dropping them off the play structure. Once, we put on a circus. Bridges is also a place available to kids that live in Roxbury. Bridge, Bridges is a very special place to all. Hi, my name is Catherine Nunnally. I work as a part of the support staff team at Montpelier High School and I'm the co-chair for the AFSCME Union, representing MRPS support staff, tech staff, and custodial staff, along with Jenny. I'm also the parent of two Main Street Middle School students, and I have an older son that was a graduate in 2022 at MHS. I love my job and the people that I work closely with each day in serving students, families, and staff. It's distressing to think that my colleagues and I may not have that opportunity in the coming year due to budget challenges facing our district. I'm not arguing against you looking into how to make the district run more efficiently, but I urge the board to do thorough research and to be transparent in your findings. If you're looking at employees, please do that at all levels from the top down to eliminate. I think the community deserves a breakdown of the pie chart that the district showed at the last board meeting. What do each of the pie pieces exactly represent? I, I implore you to keep asking questions and keep asking them until you are satisfied that you are being given truthful and informed answers. This is a relatively small school system. It is very important to me that relationships remain intact. When I send my kids off to school each day, my trust lies not just in the confidence of their teachers, but also with the other staff in the building who know the ins and outs of what goes on. People who keep our students and staff safe, people who give a smile and a word of encouragement to students or staff to get them through tough days, people who will notice if something isn't quite right with a student and refer them to a school counselor, people who go the extra mile to make sure students have enriching experiences, people who care. I hope that you see me as one of those people who care and that I've built trust and a sense of belonging with your children and with you in my years of service to the school and community, and that I, I along with my fellow school cult, school workers, will have that opportunity for years to come. Yeah. Anyone else in the room? So we have two um, on Zoom. Uh, let's go start with Joe and then Kristen. Hello, everyone. Hi, Joe. Hi, Joe. I am Joe Carroll, president of the MREA, our teachers union, and a resident of Montpelier, zooming in from Independent Screen with my two cats on the couch. Thanks for bearing with me. Uh, so I know we're facing another challenging budget season, and I represent 150 educators, and so I wanted to share three concerns with you as you consider how to craft a budget that MRPS voters will be able to support. So first, like Catherine said at the last board meeting, you saw a pie chart that showed the portion of the school budget and that included the portion for educator salaries. I just wanna emphasize that a chart that shows 67% allocation to MREA educators shouldn't really be surprising as educators directly deliver the education to the students. MREA educators are the biggest employee unit in the district, but being the biggest does not necessarily mean the most expensive or unsustainable given our role in educating the students. Second, a related point, we're concerned that you might default to the position of having to cut educator positions to reduce the budget. We want to point your attention to other parts of the budget that could be looked at, including administrator positions. I'm not super comfortable with saying that, but because it seems that reductions might again be on the table for members of our bargaining unit, the MREA, and other school workers, we're curious why administrator positions are also not on the table. 
this is not meant to disrespect the uh, administrators in any way. Some of my most cherished connections have been with them. It's just more to reflect how educators feel when the framing is that we might be too expensive, but administrator positions are somehow above scrutiny. And the last thing I'll say is that uh, we have very aspirational and hugely important district goals. Among these include belonging, equity, high levels of learning, timely systems for intervention, and many other important things. Cutting educators literally cuts opportunities for these goals to be realized. And at worst, cutting educators can communicate that these goals are more like rhetorical flourishes rather than dependent on the material conditions that the humans, the school workers create for the students. So I ask you to please explore efficiencies beyond reducing the number of school workers who show up every day to spend their days educating the kids of MRPS. I'll close with thanking you for your service to MRPS and looking forward to seeing you at future meetings. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Kristen. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Yep. Lisa? Oh. <laughs> you could hear you. Now we can't. Now we can't. Uh, how about now? Yes, yeah. you're good, Kristen. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, thanks for everything that you all do to serve in this role. Um, I know from personal experience, it's a really, really big lift. Um, I came tonight to speak to your potential vote on the Roxbury Village School, but I would of course be remiss to uh, not thank Hazel and Teddy for representing your Roxbury friends so uh, articulately and eloquently. So thank you for being there, you two. Um, so I think as as Tom has has indicated, you know, this question of the school and ownership is incredibly complex. And so I just want to urge the school board to continue to work with the Roxbury Select Board um, in ensuring that both communities and you know, especially I think the Roxbury community has has accurate information to to work with. This is not simple stuff. Um, so I just want to continue. I want to I want to advocate for um, both of these boards to work closely together so that folks have accurate information. Um, as Judy said, uh, the select board room was full this past Monday at the Roxbury Select Board meeting. Um, as of today, my understanding is, is that the Roxbury Select Board is planning to put the question of whether to resume ownership of the RBS building uh, to the voters of Roxbury on town meeting day. I gather they're expecting the board to follow the guidance received in your recent community survey. Um, regarding RVS and, and move to sell the building back to the town, if not tonight, um, soon enough, within a year from tonight. Um, and like Tom said, it sounds like the select board, um, and that was actually said in the meeting on Monday, the select board can uh, legally make that decision on behalf of the town without a town vote, but it does appear that the select board wants to be, um, wants this decision, and given its its gravity to be made by, by the broader community. Um, I I feel the need to, to be a realist. I think based on the climate of school funding in Vermont and based on survey results that you receive from the community, I, I expect this board to move to sell the building back to the town of Roxbury again, if not tonight, soon enough. <clears throat> and I'm just here to say again, which I I said at the last meeting I was at, if you do vote, uh, you know, this evening and it's a majority decision, I ask that you absolutely follow through. Uh, on the funding of maintenance of the Roxbury building through 2026 um, and make clear to all that that is non-negotiable fixed aspect of the budget, no matter how hard individuals and groups may push you. I know it's going to be another really difficult budget year, but I'm asking you to build that into the budget no matter what um, as an act of fairness to a community who lost its village school and central community hub via a two and a half week deliberation process that was painful for everybody. Um, I ask you to do that out of concern for the future of Roxbury, where MRPS students live, and because the financial impact on the MRPS budget to maintain the building for an additional year which I believe is estimated around $60,000, will have a nominal impact on tax, tax rates. Um, I'm deeply concerned that without that runway, voters of Roxbury may not vote to resume ownership of the building because there's inadequate time to develop a well thought out financial plan to resume ownership of the building. Roxbury will suffer and a massive opportunity will be lost 
and place our community within another tailspin. What ultimately becomes of this building could literally change the course of our town and shape its future. It has that much gravity. There is no roadmap here. Um, as far as I know, we're the only district currently wrangling with such complex decisions um, following a school closure. Um, and I, I think we have the opportunity to model for others. Um, as you all know, the chatter is nothing but containment and there's so much school closure talk um, just even within central Vermont that this district has and, and our communities have the opportunity to model for others what is fair and invest in the future of Vermont communities and ultimately what it means to be in partnership. Um, so again, I just urge and will appreciate all coordination with the Roxbury Select Board and our community um, to get the information that we need to understand all aspects of the RVS building question. Um, I also just want to say that Roxbury is like capital A activated. <laughs> there is so much um, activity in this community right now. So many people are um, participating in and supporting volunteer efforts to feed our community, to create um, activities and opportunities for socializing within our community at the kid level and the adult level. Um, you know, as you've heard from Tom and Judy tonight, we've had this committee for the future of the RVS building. It's comprised of people who have been in our town for a very long time, have deep connections to the school building, um, and they've been working doggedly for months to proactively think about um, RVS. So there's just, there's a lot of people that want access to the process. And I'm just gonna encourage you to continue funding the building through next year um, so that there's adequate time to ensure the community and the select board has the opportunity to come together and work together on, on the way forward. I know it's not a budget meeting tonight um, and it's already been said um, a few different ways, but the Bridges After School program at RVS is exemplary. Um, as a former after school administrator and somebody who has worked in that uh, area of education for 15 plus years, it is based on um, you know, research-based practices. Uh, there is so much opportunity for student choice, for student leadership, for opportunities to con connect with community members and, and places within our community. It's open to all of our M MRPS students, um, K through six, and I would just urge you to consider continuing to fund that program into, into the next year as well. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Thank you Thanks, Kristen. Is that too far along? All right. Um, thank you, everyone. That was uh, very helpful. Um, next, we move on to the consent agenda. The consent agenda is um, basically a tool that the board uses for expediency. It, we approve things like minutes and other things that are kind of pro forma that don't require um, discussion. If anyone on the board feels an agenda on the um, consent agenda should be pulled off, they have the option of doing that and we can discuss it then. Um, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Don't all moved. jump at once. Okay. Um, do you have a second? Second. Uh, any discussion? I had one question. Yep. Um, what does Nicole West do? The person that you said left the agency of education? Nicole Lee. Nicole Lee, yeah. That, that was it. I don't know what she does presently. She does not work for but, the agency of education anymore. The, the, she the chief financial officer. She was the chief financial oh, okay. officer. Yeah. And so there's a just an there Just are five open did. positions in the Agency of Education's financial department. I believe two positions are filled. Yeah. And before Nicole, it was Brad James, who was a pretty well-known institution of non education finance and whatnot. So. Brad, is, Brad is back in the yeah. consultant. Yeah. consultant. We were told we were going to get our first draft of long-term weighted pupils two weeks ago, and we had not heard anything. <clears throat> yeah, that's why it'd be that's a got it. harbinger of things to come. Yeah, hopefully not. Um, uh, all in favor of the approval of the consent agenda? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstentions? Abstentions. Um, Thank you, Sue. Uh, all looking forward to special ed state of the state. Thank you. Can I make a request here? 
Sure. Can we, can we bump the uh, Roxbury discussion up? Because there's people from Roxbury who are here to hear it. Um, yeah, we're kind of, um, do you think we can, well, I'm, I'm hesitant because um, Peggy is on the agenda. I know she's she's a, a paid employee and looking to get back to her family. I'm not sure how long the rest of her discussion will take, although I appreciate your sentiment on that. I don't know what what is what is the board thing. I, uh, it's it's hard to be fair to everyone here. Did you plan on taking a very long time? I mean, really, really, I will not be more than 15 minutes. Yeah, well, good. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that was, um, no, I, I appreciate the sentiment, but. Yeah, no, and I normally would be more flexible than my husband. Because dad is in the hospital, though, my son is in the hospital. Um, and I was in the hospital, though, my son is with my younger kids right now. Okay. Uh, so, sorry. Okay. Is that working? No. Whoops. Wait, hold on. Okay, you can share a screen or do I need it? Um, oh yeah, no, I can. Uh from Zoom has a Oh, what did I do? Oh geez. All right. Sorry. Oh no, it is. Why is it not? Yeah, click that box right there. Click here. Yeah. Oh, okay. And then pop it back to you. Go here. You got it. Okay, there we go. All right. Okay. I'll be quick. I heard that message loud and um, so I, um, sorry, I didn't realize people were going to be here. I would have made more copies, but everyone does have a copy of my slides. Um, Libby asked me to do kind of an overview of where things stand in the world of special education right now in the district. So, uh, there's a lot of data in here, but not necessarily a lot of data that we have to go into great detail about. So, um, the first slide here is just a comparison data to a point in time. So last year, um, when we did the data report to you all, those were the numbers um, of students with the IEPs in the district in 504s. And so um, on November 1st, I just took that number so we could compare to see where we are at. Um, as you can see, we continue to increase um, our number of students with disabilities in the district. Um, some of that increased. We did have a lot of students move in this summer from, I don't know where they're getting housing, but there's a lot of people moving into Montpelier, um, also from within Vermont, from out of state. And we also had, um, I would say, a handful of kids move in from independent schools. So, um, you know, like uh, Orchard Valley, for example, we had a number of kids move in. So um, some of this increase in number is around the move in. It's not necessarily all students that have been here all along um, being identified now, but we are having an increase. So we've yeah. it is, so. it, yes, yeah, that is, yes. Um, so we'll keep watching that. Um, okay, the next few slides are just some demographic information. Um, so this fall, the state shared some state and national information um, with us at a director's meeting. Their information is from the 22-23 school year because they do annual reporting every February, so they're getting ready to do that again. Um, but I, it felt like the it's the most recent information we have. Um, the district information is from our child count, which we do every December 1st, so we're getting ready to do that again. Um, but I decided that was the best information to use because it changes so much, like our child count can change every day depending on where someone is in the evaluation process and that kind of stuff. Um, and so I wanted to have a point in time um, where we um, had the information. So this um, set of demographics here is looking at um, race and ethnicity and gender. And I would say that in looking at the, the information, we are pretty similar um, and aligned with the rest of the state numbers um, as far as that goes. I'm gonna buzz through stuff and then you can ask questions later if you have any. Um, the next slide is looking at the disability categories. Um, and again, it's looking at national percentages, Vermont percentages, and then percentages in our district. Um, there are a few things that uh, when I look at this, I um, had questions about or wondered about. One of the things is the high number nationally of students under speech and language impairment compared to Vermont and to our district. Um, 
my assumption is that that correlates to the fact that nationally there's a pretty low number of students with developmental delay and it's much higher in our state and for in Montpelier. So a lot of, so developmental delay is students three to six years old and um, speech is one of the categories that is under that, but it's a more umbrella term. And so my assumption, and it's just my assumption, is that the reason that that is so much lower or that we have a higher, uh, sorry, developmental um, delay number and a lower speech number is because we're doing more early intervention. So I think that's actually a good thing for us because the speech and language um, doesn't start till six years old, that disability category. So I think that those numbers probably are reflective of each other. Um, the other number I noticed um, that is a little bit higher for us in Montpelier and in, um, in Vermont than nationally is other health impairment. The, that is um, medical issues, but that's also what ADHD and anxiety fall under. And so with um, our change in our regs where we're looking at functional skills now as an adverse effect area, um, I think that's part of the reason that number is higher because now we're not just looking at academic um, needs, we're also looking at that functional skill more. Good. I'm watching the clock. Okay. The next one um, is looking at least restrictive environment for students with IEPs. And as you can see here, Vermont, and our, we're pretty aligned with Vermont, but it's much higher than what it looks like um, overall nationally for students with disabilities being uh, inside the regular classroom at least 80% of the time. Um, one of the things that is not on a chart here, but certainly aligns with that is we also have a much higher number of IAs that we use. <laughs> and so um, one of the conversations that we've had in our regional directors meetings is that a lot of our inclusion is supported because we have so many IAs. And so that number um, would may be lower if we weren't able to have the number of supports that we do in classes right now. Uh, the other number I will point out to you is that in Vermont, we have a higher rate of um, students and, and here in our district, higher, we are higher than Vermont um, for students that are placed in separate day schools. So those are our students that are um, being tuitioned to therapeutic schools um, because we're not able to uh, meet all of their needs in our public schools. All right, the next one um, is looking at the percentage of students overall, um, three to 21 that have IEPs. And um, Vermont is a little higher than the national average and we are a little lower than the average in Vermont. Um, and then the second one is um, the percentage of our students with IEPs that are serviced under extraordinary costs. So that's more than $66,000 a year. Um, is their cost. And as you can see, we um, are almost double the state average with that. Um, so though the students that generally fall under that category are again, the students that we are tuitioning out. And then there are also students that um, are in our schools that have a high level of either IA support, contracted services, that kind of thing that makes their individual cost over that $66,000 mark. There is a different reimbursement that happens once we get past that mark that I used to know, but then Christina said there's a new something that they're doing with that. So I can't completely explain it to you, um, but it um, there is a, a different reimbursement that we get past that. And it's very notable that we are almost double what the state average is for that. All right. The next page is just um, a list of who who I am talking about when I talk about special education staff and contracted services. So there's myself and my assistant, Pam. We have 18.5 special educators currently, plus we have one unfilled position still. Uh, we have four speech language pathologists. We have our evaluation team. Um, our, so that's our one school psychologist and another special educator, not in that 18 and a half. We have a behavior specialist. We have a liter literacy interventionist that only works with students with IEPs, two social emotional learning professionals. And then currently we have seven IAs that are at the behavior tech level and 26 IAs that are instructional or intensive needs. And then we have a lot of contracted services. So occupational therapy is a contracted service, physical therapy. We work with teachers of the visually impaired, teachers of the deaf and hard of hearing, 
The UVM um, iTeam is a team that comes and consults with teams with um, for students with more complex needs. And then we have some students that have behavior technicians that we're contracting still um, with local mental health agencies, transportation, and then tutors. So that is um, our what I'm talking about when I'm talking about our staff, because on the next page, there are, yeah. Educator, mm -hmm. we're fully staffed otherwise. We are, yes, this is, especially with IA, it's amazing. It's, it's a celebration. Um, and we did try a couple different ways to fill that position earlier this year. So we looked first for a special educator, and then we tried to see if we could get a literacy specialist to do services, thinking maybe there would be a different um, you know, pool of people and we were not able to find someone. Um, so I think with January or December graduations, we might be able to put that out again and see if we're able to fill that position. Um, okay, this page is just looking at where the special ed expenditures are. So as um, you can see, um, the staff salaries and benefits, the benefits word didn't come on there, is a little over half um, of the money that we spend. Um, the next biggest part of the pie chart is related services. In that is actually some of the people that we employ. So that is our speech language pathologist, our school psychologist is in there. Um, that is the occupational therapist, the physical therapist. There's part of social workers come out of special ed money um, and then contracted services. So that the our, our staff salary and benefits actually would be higher um, if, but um, it's important to, I think, to separate them because they do provide a different type of service than the special educators and um, instructional assistants. Um, the next biggest chunk is our tuition out. Um, it, so that's just under 20% of our special ed expenditures go to tuition for students in therapeutic schools. Uh, in of those students, 50% of them are have a primary disability of emotional disturbance. Um, just about a third of them uh, have a primary disability of autism, and then the other 21% um, have different uh, different primary disabilities. And then there's administration, uh, which is me and Pam, and then transportation. So um, any students that we are um, tuitioning out, we are uh, providing transportation to get to those schools, as well as we have some students that require specialized transportation to our schools. Okay, the next couple of slides are looking at the opportunity gap. So um, looking at students' um, achievements on the state testing um, compared to students without IEPs uh, for state testing. So this first one is looking at English language arts. Um, and we are, this one shows that we are trending in the right direction. If you look on the right side, um, you can see that our opportunity uh, gap um, Wait a minute. Yes. No. Hold on. Maybe I'm saying this backwards. Oh, it increased. So no, this is not the one that we're happy about. Other than, so the gap increased slightly, but when we look at the number of students with IEPs who are achieving at level one, that number has gone down. So we are, despite the fact that the gap is not looking in the right way yet when we compare the number of students that have moved from level one to two, that actually is increasing. So we are going in the right way. That number just doesn't show it yet. Does that make sense? Say it again, no. Yes, okay. So if you look at the difference between 23 and 24, or there, in 2023, there was a 40%, 47% difference between yeah. students that did not have IEPs and students with IEPs. And then the next year that increased. So that's actually not what we want to right. do. But then if you look all the way to the left and you look at achievement level uh -huh. one, so that's the lowest, we have less students this past year that are at that level. So they're moving, they're making progress, they're up in level two. So they're not proficient yet, yeah. but they are moving in the right direction. Yep. All right, math. Um, we see a decrease in the opportunity gap. Um, unfortunately, if you look closely, though, it's not because the students with IEPs are doing better. It's because the students without IEPs did worse. So, so when you look at the number, the, no, the percentage of students with IEPs that were proficient stayed the same. But there was a big difference between um, the proficient level, the percentage of students 
without IEPs that were proficient in 2023 and that in 2024. So if we just look at the gap, we can pat ourselves to the back, but then when you look at why, it's not as great. Um, and there is um, some more students with IEPs that were at level one last year than the year before. So that one, that's more concerning because that's not trending the way we want. Yes. So you know how every time we get to see you, I ask, how do we know if our system is- You, hold on. Oh, it's actually a good indicator. Okay. Don't you think like- It is, it is one indicator. Yes. One of them. Yes, that's absolutely. The only, but yes. it's really fabulous. I just want to just highlight that it's fabulous to have this data to see the difference that we have in students who have an IEP and students who don't, yeah. to see things moving in the direction we want to would be, would be an indicator yes. of our system working. Absolutely. So, thank and you. I have to give Mike credit because I just took his information. I don't do these. <laughs> He's definitely the one that does this data. He and Nick. Mike and Nick. Mike and Nick. Thank you, Mike and Nick. Yeah. Glad to have it. Okay. Yes. Um, so then science, there is um, a great change in the opportunity gap. So there are many more students last year that um, were proficient that had IEPs. Um, and the tricky part with science is this isn't the same co cohort of students. So it, here it is, but it doesn't, this one is trickier because they only take them every couple of years. So I included that, but you know, it's minimal information for us. And then just to make sure people were aware, we also have a small percentage of students that take an alternate assessment to the state assessment. And so this is what their data looks like. And it's, they're, they're a small like, number. And this is really just so people know that if this exists. Okay, and then, yeah, look at this. So remember last year I came with my picture, my paper with my stickers. Yes. Now, Mike helped me figure out how to create groups in Renstar so that I can actually look at them without having to do sticker charts. <laughs> so the next several slides is looking at the growth rate and the achievement rate. So again, achievement is vertical and the growth rate is horizontal and the dotted lines are where we want to, that's typical, right? So the um, if we're looking at the proficiency, that that dotted line is what is considered proficient in our district. And then the um, vertical line is showing average growth. So our hope is that our hope, hope is not a strategy. My husband always tells me our goal is to have as many students as possible on the, uh, on the right side of the growth because we want to close the gap. So we want them to have more than a typical amount of growth. So in the next several slides, what I did is I created groups of students with who have IEPs at the different schools. So we could look at this for um, literacy and for math. These results are only students that took it in the spring. So this looks at spring to fall. We will look at them again in December and uh, after December, and we'll be able to see the growth from the beginning of the year till now. And then what I did is I created groups of students who are receiving reading services on an IEP and students receiving math services on an IEP. You do not have that information in here, but that actually targets because this, when we look at all of these next several pages, <laughs> excuse me, these are all students with IEPs, but they're not necessarily getting math services. So when we look at students, the, the um, RunStar math results, we don't know for sure, looking at this chart, right? These aren't necessarily all students getting math services. So this wouldn't tell us if our math intervention through special ed is working. So we ha I have also got smaller cohorts now for each of the schools that are only students receiving those services. So then uh, after we administer this in December, I can sit with um, school uh, administrators and case managers and look at specifically students receiving reading services. How did they do on the literacy thing? And when you're on this site, and this is just a screenshot, when you hover over a bubble, it tells you who the student is and it shows you what where they were at and where they are now. Um, so it's a really good conversation starter. It is a screener. It is not the end all be all but it is something that can then have us look at it and say, is that, does this make sense with what we're seeing? Let's talk about this. Did the kid just you know, push through the test? Did we have them do it again? The other thing that Julie showed me today, which I didn't know, 
I love having a team that helps me learn is that when I compare it to the state, so these are district benchmarks. When I compare it to the state, it shows what the benchmark is that the state sets for proficient and then shows us how close the kids are to meeting that. So this is comparing them to all of the students in our school. And the state one is showing us what is the state target. So it has a very different look when I look at it. So doing that shows me what how close we are or should be in alignment with what we're going to be asking them to do on the state test. And is the difference on the state one that the dotted lines are in a different place? Mm -hmm. That's what and the it's because is. it's a score. Got so it. right, because it's a score rather okay. than this is percentile rank compared to other kids in their schools. Right. And Julie has figured out the statewide pretty much tracks with our results on statewide tests. Which is interesting. Yeah. So when I when she showed me that today, I was like Mind blown, yeah. but I wasn't going to put it in here, but it is very different to see. Um, and certainly the literacy scores, we were right around the, it was very different as far as being right around where the state um, mark was, as opposed to comparing our students to each other. Right. Uh, right math, now, these dotted lines are average in our district. Yes. Okay. Yep. Yep. Does that make sense? So the Multiple. cool thing is, I know, I know. Believe me, today I was like, whoa, how did I not know this before? Um, so as you look at these, you can see, um, you know, this is just information for um, me to be able to do, like I said, with case managers to talk about it. It's, um, and if we have students that are, you know, showing low growth and show low achievement, um, if we're doing services, then we need to look at the services and maybe what's not working. Do we need to change what we're doing? Do we need to make them more intense? Um, if it's a student that doesn't have services, should we be talking about services? So this is um, a great conversation starter. Any questions about all of those? Just to confirm, yep. we would like what, what our goal is, not our hope, but our mm -hmm. goal yep. is to have more circles in the upper right-hand quadrant. Mm -hmm. That's what you're working for. Yep, because okay. that's high growth and high and achievement. And it. if as long as, if it's not necessarily at high achievement yet, we at least want them to be on the right-hand side because right. that means they're growing faster than a year. Right. Yeah. Yep. Um, in the IEP no section for math 2023, should the percentages add up to 100%? Uh, uh, no, because there are some students that take the alternate assessment, so they would not be included, but let me see. It's just the only section where the numbers don't uh, Where it's 6, 19, 30, 45. No, no. Which, where is it again? Okay, IEP math, 52. Oh, I'm on the LA. Sorry, I was looking at the LA. Oh, so you're saying across? They yeah. don't add up? 18. No. Oh, they're way bigger. 15, 61, 67, 16. If you add all that together. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There, that's a good. Oh, gosh, I didn't that. I'll ask Mike. I'm going to blame it on Mike because he's not here. <laughs> Thank you for listening that. <laughs> okay. And then the last part, because we're more than 15 minutes, sorry, is um, just wanted to share some information. So every um, June, the AOE sends out um, through like a college in New York or something a survey out to parents of students with IEPs um, looking to get feedback. <laughs> and um, they have a low response rate across the state as we do, um, but our response rate was higher than the state average, so we'll go with that. Uh, so I wanted to just share with you all what those are. So you, we have the questions, and then this is the information that we just got within the last month, um, and then I added the results from last year just so you could see the difference. So this is a one to four scale, one being never, four being always, and the thing that um, I had to keep, I had to draw little arrows on my paper to remind me is that the one that is farthest on the right is actually two years ago, as opposed to the one on the left is the most current one. So when you look at that way, we've shown growth and everything, but I kept thinking like, oh, wait, and then I'd be like, nope, I'm reading it backwards. So um, those, there's a couple of slides with that, that just shows you what are the questions that are being asked, um, and then the last uh, page just shows you the number. It just is what they show us. So we had 20, uh, 173 mailed out and 28 were returned um, the year before that. So that was like a 16% response rate. Um, the year before that, we had about a 12% response rate. 
statewide and they have an 8% response rate. So um, none of those are great. We would love to have more input from parents and as a student with a parent with a student with a disability, I know I don't fill my own when it comes. So sorry, Essex, I'll work on that. Um, so trying to figure out how to, to get more parents to, to provide that input. Um, and I'm gonna take whatever data I have. So of the, the returned ones that we had two years ago and this year, um, uh, 22, 23, we had 63% of the surveys that were returned that had the majority of responses that were always or often. And then this most recent one is 79%. So again, it feels like even though it's a small data point, I'm gonna celebrate it because we're trending in the right direction. What is the difference between these two? They both say 2023, 24. They're different questions. Oh, there's more questions. Got yeah. It. Okay. Yeah. It's like a continuate. It's all yeah. the same survey. It's all the same survey. It's just two questions. Yep. And then that's the end. You have a magnifying glass. I know. So I, we will put, I know. Sorry. <laughs> when you get the link, you can zoom it. Yeah, yeah. And read that <laughs> I know. Thank you. And that's it. Question date. Yeah, thanks, Peggy Sue. Um, yeah. On that first slide, um, so there's like a 42 and uh, 42 more students on IEPs, um, which is a pretty significant increase. Um, and that's from from new families. The very first slide. Yeah, there's um, 20. So 156 to 176. But if you add up pre uh, K. So yeah, there's the, one more in pre-K, and then the bottom is students with 504 plans. Is that where you adding that? Oh, okay, about? sorry. So yeah. some IEPs, some 504s. Yes. So but... 21 more for, yes, with pre-K to 12 for IEPs, and then, yeah, and then another for 21 that are 504s. And, yeah, okay. And you said that it's from families who moved into the district from some of it yeah there's that there was certainly a significant number of students that moved in um, over the summer um with yeah it's not all obviously there are some also students being newly identified but th there was enough of that that it felt like we were, were doing a lot of when students move in from out of state especially we have to do an evaluation under vermont regs even if they're eligible somewhere else um and lindsay was saying wow there's a lot of movement here <laughs> so yeah. And is this 42 in individual students or is there some overlap? Maybe there's a student that has both an IEP no. and a 504? No. no, these are all different, yeah. all 42 yeah. individual kids. Yep. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. If kids are coming from like alternative education settings, homeschooling, and mm -hmm. other types of settings, do they have the same uh, initial evaluation that someone coming from out of state does? So we have a what's called a child find obligation to if there are students in home study or if they are in independent schools in our towns and there's a suspicion of a disability that we are um, assessing them. And um, so some of this number would include students that aren't necessary. Most of them are in our school, but we do have some students that are in home study or are attending independent schools um, within like the farm for a school, for example. If there are students there that there's a concern about a disability, then it's our obligation as the school district that their school is within to um, evaluate them. The difference is they don't have um, a right to special education services unless they enroll in the public school. So we have to find them and we have to say, if you come to public school, you know, you would get services, this is a need you have, but there is no entitlement for services if you are homeschooled or in an independent school that you is parentally placed, different than the therapeutic schools that we do. Any of those are there incentives for any of those types of so I feel like there's a difference between homeschooling, mm -hmm. strictly homeschooling, mm -hmm. and then homeschooling where there are a lot of alternative um, opportunities. Is there any incentive for incentive for educators in alternative settings to reach out to you? Um, like, would they would they know that they should be reaching out to the district? I, I think they do. We definitely about. have that. Yeah. And there's like a very teeny tiny amount of money that's in our um, federal special ed grant that is for students that are in home study or in an independent school. Like it's so tiny that, you know, it's like 
but there is a wondering comment. wondering how people know to reach out. Yeah, so know. part of what we have to do is we do notices to like doctor's offices and we put in the, you know, do people read newspapers anymore? But anyway, we have to post and make sure that people are aware that this is part of our obligation. The thing that gets tricky is when kids live in Montpelier but attend a school like in Barrie. So then Barrie would actually be the district that's responsible for evaluating them. So that gets a little confusing for families but it's based on the geographic location of the school that you were in. And I, I was also wondering about the male female breakdown on like the second slide. Mm -hmm. Is that a trend that is moving in any particular direction as far as you know, over the, over the years, over the decade, over the last 10 years, or is there, is that, a, is that a consistent, is it consistently that disproportional that, uh, um, have more I don't I haven't looked at that but my guess would be that that's pretty tip, that you know yes, I think uh, yes I think I that's know, part of it is yeah mm -hmm. okay. nationally it is yes okay. for sure yeah yes um thanks just really quick thank you very much I really appreciate it. I'm a geek and so I like the data um if you were to zoom out based on what you're seeing in these data yeah. um what is like one thing that you would like to like celebrate and what's mm -hmm. one thing that um is concerning to you uh so celebrate i think that's easy i think um i look at the literacy um services that we have in place the um training that we're doing with the teachers the training that the special educators have done and i feel like we have done an amazing job in really upping all of um, the understanding of literacy and um, and we are seeing awesome results of a number of kids. A number of kids are no longer needing services or, you know, it's just, I think that's really been great. Um, Particularly the, at Main Street Middle School. Yes, for sure. Yep. Um, and um, I also will celebrate um, that there are, when I came to this district, there was a lot of tension, I would say, with um, caregivers around special education. And I feel like there have been a lot of, there's been a lot of repair done to a lot of relationships. Um, and um, I th think, um, you know, yeah. So that feels really good to me. I think that we have a lot of families and students that are feeling better about the experience they're getting, they're trusting more um, it, that we are um, able to figure out what their kids need and we're getting them that. Um, I would say that math is now the area that we're looking at as a district. And um, the other thing that uh, I still am trying to wrestle with is just kind of how to do this in the best way to maximize the expertise of people we have. Um, you know, we have a really, um, I would say, pretty incredible intervention system. And we have a lot of specialists um, in our different tiers and then we get to special educators and we're asking them to do everything and be experts in everything. And so, you know, trying to look at, is there more a, a more efficient way to provide services and get that expertise so that we're not burning out our amazing special educators. Um, so I would say that's something I'm still working on. And um, I would say just uh, as every other school in the country, also just trying to continue to work with Jess around how to support students um, around just their social emotional well-being so that they can access what we're asking them to access. Excellent, thank you. Further questions for Peggy Sue? Oh, do I have to do something? Stop sharing. Well, thank you again. This is super helpful and we really appreciate both all your hard work and the the extensive data, it's really um, gives us a good picture of the work and the progress. And I love the little bubble charts. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> they're really yeah. fun. And yeah, like they're I fun. Said, and, and they Julie showed me today, I was like, oh my gosh, what else do I not know? So that's the other great thing is I would say I have learned so much in just a couple of years around data. Um, and I feel like as the teams I'm seeing so much use of data, understanding of data, and so that's another celebration. Thank Excellent. You. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Yeah. Thank uh, you for us. Yes. So now we are moving into the 
discussion of the Roxbury Village School. Um, and we have a potential decision to make. And just for a quick recap, um, we went through, we've kind of been going through a process pretty much all fall. Um, we started out with, I think, six options and um, through a variety of, of input from the public um, and a meeting in, in September, I believe, uh, reduced it to three options, basically. One was to, um, well, let me just step back. For the contract merger agreement that both towns agreed to uh, in 2017 or 2018, which- 2017. Yeah, 2017, and the merger occurred in 2018. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, yeah, the two towns agreed that the school would stay open for a period of four years. And then after that period, depending on um, you know, whatever circumstances, the uh, board could discontinue the use of that building as a school. Um, that happened, as we all know, last year, given budget and other considerations, uh, you know, and, and I think in a way that no one was happy about, but unfortunately that was the situation we found ourselves in. Um, we are now at a point where the ownership of the building is, is at issue and, and the contract governs that where if the board makes a determination that there is not a necessary use of the building, um, that the building is unnecessary for the educational use of the district, um, it is then uh, directed to offer the building back to the town for a dollar. The, do the town is not under any obligation to take it back for, for a dollar, but the uh, town originally gave the building to or transferred the building to the district for a dollar. Um, again, that the, the the finding is that there is not a necessary use. It is not that there is not an educational use or and it's not and if we make a finding that there is not a necessary use, it does not mean that we can not continue to use the building. Uh, it's just that the use is unnecessary for the operation of, of the school district. Um, and then the town basically can take the building if they for a dollar, as long as it has uh, some sort of kind of community or public use for five years. Uh, it then takes the ownership outright after five years. If within those five years, it changes it to a non-community use, uh, the town would be liable to the district for uh, improvements made while the district owned the building, which I think are about to the tune of 45,000. Yeah, 45, approximately 45,000. Do not quote me. It's it's in that neighborhood. Um, 45 to 90,000. 45 to 90,000. And while community use is not defined in the um agreement in the merger agreement um that the parameters of that could likely be agreed on and any transfer back to the town and it is likely that any sort of kind of public use would would satisfy that um that provision so uh the high likelihood that the the town could assume it without incurring the the risk of, of those payments um so we put out, we boil it down to three options. The three options were that we uh, off, we make a decision that the there is not a necessary use. We offer it back to the town. We begin those discussions uh, and we uh, continue to maintain uh, the building and also the current after school programming until the details of that uh, transfer are worked out uh, and the building goes back to the town. Uh, the second is the second to contemplate the, the school or the district keeping that building, uh, one kind of running the existing aftercare program, and the second would be uh, some sort of expanded use of the building um, built, you know, based on that aftercare program, but perhaps with with more. Uh, and we and then solicited, you know, more public comment on those three options uh, and the overwhelming district-wide 
and I say district wide because it was both towns, uh, feedback on that, which of course is not determinative, but informative of our decision tonight, uh, was to uh, transfer the building back to Roxbury and, um, and uh, you know, maintain that building and, and the use of that building until that transfer is, is worked out. Uh, so that's kind of where we're at now. Um, and now we can yeah, open it up to both, you know, any sort of board discussion, uh, comment, uh, and um, make a decision about whether or not we want to make a decision uh, primarily on the necessity of the use of the building and, and start that process of transferring back to the town or not. So I will leave it there. And if I left out details, uh, please feel free to fill in with the urban yeah, I think are most up to speed. Um, you know, and also as was brought up tonight, there is a uh, proposal to um, from uh, a local private school to rent space in the building as well as um, another small, I believe a small business. Um, child care center. Child care center. Um, and, uh, yeah, so that is something that either the district or the town, uh, could entertain as a potential use for that building. If the town did that, I think that would, I, I'm 99% sure that, uh, that would likely constitute a community use of the building. So, um, that is out there as well. And I just want to make one correction. I'm sorry. I just pulled up Andrew's figures for capital improvements to make sure the board has the right information. The bathroom renovations there were about 90K. The heat pumps were about 75K. And the um, the kitchen was upgraded, but it wasn't included in the cost because it was right at the time of the merger. And remote DDC access is 25K. So it's Just closer, potentially. Yeah, because it's potentially two. I'm doing that. Yeah. yeah, I just want to make sure. Sorry, yeah. that was my fault. Yeah. I can only hold so much stuff in my head. Is is the district not allowed to rent to a private school? Is it or am I misconstruing something that we talked about weeks ago? Uh, well, I think there's a. I mean, I think there's. I don't think we're prohibited from doing that. Uh, our and living room. My understanding is our insurance company does not like the idea um in a big way they have strongly recommended against it yes uh basically because the district would be liable for anything that happened at the at the school but not under controlled premises um uh the the uh select board which we also heard earlier um uh, is a, apparently poised to ask the town for a vote for an advisory vote on whether or not to transfer the building. Uh, they also sent us a letter recently asking that we not lease the building um, if, if we're going to plan if, to sell it. If we're going to plan to sell it, that we not lease the building. Um, Jill. Are the, is the, are the entities that are proposing a lease the same as the Bridges program? No. Okay. No, it's the Bridges uh, program is ours. Um, yeah. It's the okay. Vermont. Farben Forest School, which okay. is a private school, which opened what a few years ago, right? A while ago, in yeah. maybe 2015, 2014. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I just wanted to be really understand, you know, the community input about the after school bridges yeah. program is not that's our program. That's our program. Yes. Okay. Um, I definitely want to do right by Roxbury, um, and I'm excited about these possibilities. Um. But um, if if the if it goes till March to put it to a vote, um, are they going to lose the possible renters and in the interest of? They said we had to act within a couple weeks or something. So March is many months away. Uh, I have that question too. Like, you, yeah, how important is it? Kind of be a town meeting vote if the selectmen could make the decision. That's I think that's, that's the select board's decision. That's the select ours. board's decision. So, um, yeah. So I, I think that's that's the select board's decision. So yeah, I mean they could move more quickly. Uh, 
Yeah. I mean, because if we can't have these tenants because of insurance problems, it it seems sort of ridiculous to lose two tenants, right? On some level, because that would help support the building. Yes, and that seems it seems like something for the Roxbury to select the board to work out. Um, it, it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I understand my insurance concern. I also understand why they would want an advisory vote. So, like, is it possible to? I mean, the the timeline just makes it difficult because we can really rent it to them for like three months or whatever and then just hope that the town decides to buy the building and that like I mean my guess is that the town would have to work out something with, with the renters. Yeah. Um, I mean I just and maybe agree to provisionally lease depending on how the vote goes. I just I would uh, love to be able to help with this because it seems like such a wonderful thing yeah. for the building to be used for. It's just I think you could add Can I say, yeah. um, Missy Doe, who is the owner of and, and operator of the Farm and Forest School, yeah. we need you at the table. At the table Thank you. Sorry, Judy. Okay, Judy Lusk. Um, Missy asked that, and you have the letter from her. She asked that she be given a letter of intent by the end of January. And the reason for that, she said, was that she would be able to work out contracts with her teachers uh, because she might lose them if she doesn't get yeah. contracts. And so she, she actually would not be taking um, occupation of the building until the middle of August. And, but she, does have other options that she's looking at. And it's very important to us that whoever it is, you or the select board, um, make some kind of a gesture to her. And so are you saying that your insurance company has said that she's a no-go if you were to own the building in August? Yes, yes. They, they strongly encourage us not to lease to yeah. anyone. Not yeah. in particular. Yes. But okay. the town could have a different answer and, and the town could arguably be in. Now, is that because you're connected to the public school district? Or would, would Roxbury run into the same problem with no, insurance? It's all, it's all because of the pub, public school. I see. Needs. Okay. Yes. Yeah, that, no, it's not. That's... Insurance company is an insurance company for all school districts. Sure. The okay. Yeah. And they yeah. want an answer for the town of Roxbury. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, if you were to offer the building sooner than town meeting day, then I think that would maybe kick our select board into gear a little more. That, um, I, had, I was wondering. Yes, that. yes because they do not um, have to wait. You know, we were at the meeting and we the other night, and we felt as though they were moving in the right direction, uh -huh. but it's a tough go. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but if you were to come up with a date tonight to say on this date, we plan to offer the building to the town of Roxbury, then that's going to get the ball rolling. That's what I think. I mean, yeah. We, yeah. yeah. I know this is already the protocol, but you want Tom well, to come yeah. up? Yeah. 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 Thank you Oh, thank you. Only because you can't be heard at home without being by the microphone. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I'm just going to read for, to you from our report. So what needs to happen? First, the select board needs the requested decision from the MRS board, MRPS board, as soon as possible. Okay. Okay. Um, both of the rental possibilities are time sensitive. Letters of intent need to be offered to them by January 30th of 2025. We're asking that the select board make a decision at the November 18th meeting to move ahead with a meeting with the MRPS board to work out a timeline 
So the rental um, options are not lost. If the MRPS board issued a letter of intent to offer the building to the town by a specific date, the select board would, would then offer the potential lessees a letter of intent to rent based on voter approval to take the building back. That was back, that was before we realized that they don't really need voter approval. Our select board is only doing that for cover. Um, you know, they don't want to make the decision. They want the town to make it. Um, and also they have to vote a budget to support the building because, you know, if this falls through, we have to put the, keep the heat on. Um, so, so really it, the timeline has to be that you, you offer the town the building back. They agreed to take the building back on town meeting day. In the meantime, they said they can give a letter of intent to rent and Missy can contract with her teachers based on that intent because she's not interested in doing anything until, until August. August. Yeah. So, you know, that's the timeline that needs to happen. So that's why I was hoping that tonight you guys would decide to make that decision. Maybe you're not going to use today's date, but you could say as of, um, you know, December 15th, we're going to offer it to the town and you have until town meeting day to work out the details. I mean, I don't know how many details that can be worked out, but you got months, you know, two or three months there. So, you know, it could easy. it seems to me it could easily be done. Um, I don't think it took that long to take the building. I don't see how long it took to take, to take the building back. But that's that's what we're looking at. Yeah. And, and that's what we're asking. It's like uh, Renee wants to get in. Uh, Renee is the, uh, okay, great. the is chair of the select board. So select board. Um, go for it. Yes, hello. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Yep. Okay. Hi. Uh, Renee Bouchard, uh, uh, chair of the Roxbury Select Board. So at our meeting on Monday evening, uh, which I think was a very good meeting, there was good discussion, et cetera. And it was helpful that Missy was there uh, from the Farm and Forest School. Uh, two things to note about the letters that we discussed at the meeting. The first letter from the uh, Child Care Center is not uh, time dependent from the standpoint that they're a firm that just started business on October 7th. And in the letter itself, it did not set a deadline. And the model for a school like that would be, you know, 12 months, right? A child care is not doesn't operate on the same business model as the farm and forest, which would be September to June, sort of normal school, having to get teachers, et cetera. And Missy was uh, was open at, to listening and hearing and appreciated our desire to have the voters uh, provide guidance on, on the school and what we do. Um, you know, the fact is, is, you know, we're not just trying to get cover. I think it's important for the, uh, for the voters to provide us with some direction. And that direction is, you know, we have, we want direction on whether we should buy the building, which I think is a, quite frankly, is a no brainer because, um, you know, we really want to get possession of our town hall, uh, and, as I said in our letter, you know, we really highly value the uh, the after school program. It's like so helpful for our parents and it's very important to the community. So um, anyway, we want a town vote so that, that to provide guidance to the board. And then we also need to look at other options. You know, there are multiple options. Tom and his group did a great job putting together one option, uh, but we have, they represented, you know, 12 to 20 people with their opinions. And, you know, we represent 600 and we have other people who have voiced other ideas. And, you know, um, we, we want to synthesize it down and just put it, have a good discussion with folks and get a vote on other options. And we don't want to be locked into one. And that is why we requested that if you were to be offering the building back in the near term that to not 
enter into any leases at this time. No, thank you, Renee. That's, that, that's helpful. Okay, thank you. Scott. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm I'm extremely sympathetic to the concerns of of the Roxbury community for sure. Um, I I think our job really is only to think about the the educational use of the building, um, and and determine whether or not we feel it's necessary. Beyond that, it yeah, I mean, again, I'm sympathetic, but that's not our role. Um, I I've been thrilled to hear the feedback from the Roxbury families about bridges. Um, it's been nice to hear positive feedback from um, that the Roxbury residents um, around the school. Um, most of my time on the board, it, it hasn't been that way. Um, I, I just want to, one, like, I don't, I, I heard the, the plea to act quickly. Um, and I just want to remind folks, that's how we got into this situation. Um, and I think being mindful and thoughtful um, about the decision um, really will lead us to a better um, outcome. And um, yeah, I just, one question I have, and I don't know that we have an answer, is if there was any, like the, the Bridges program is, is thriving, right? That is, there, that's clear. Um, I, I wouldn't want to do anything at this point to preclude that from continuing. Um, and so if, yeah, and so I just want to consider that as, as we move forward. I don't, I don't, I mean, I think we definitely should offer it to the town for a dollar and that, that doesn't seem like a question in my mind. It seems like there's a lot of momentum for bridges and, and that will continue. Um, and I, I personally think the board should, should include that in the budget. I don't know if we're planning not to. Um, the only question is about timeline and, you know, whatever makes sense for the town is a good timeline for me. Um, and yeah, I don't see it as complicated, but it's personal. Yeah. Um, I was going to make a motion. So I, I move that the board finds there is no necessary use of Roxbury Village School for the educational purposes of the district. I second that. Sure. Let's have it up for discussion. I guess it will be so. Miriam. Yeah, just to be clear, that's why I made the motion, just so yeah. that we're discussing an actual thing. Yes. No. <laughs> and also, uh, I believe it's the right course of action. Yes. And it's, yeah, no. Because I think it will get us to the result that I think, as far as I can tell, we as a board want, yes. which is for Roxbury to be able to have agency over this space and make it the community center that yeah. they envision it to be. As we all know, I can't vote. Um, but if I could, I would be in favor of this motion. And I think Jake said it very well. And I can't say it better. And uh, I hope we move to sell this building to the town. Bye. I'd like to second that and say that at the Roxbury meeting um, a few weeks ago, I really appreciated Dottie's um, beautiful presentation of what you would like the, the building to look like because that seems excellent for the students and for the community. And I hope that we're able to do that for the school and the community because it's a beautiful representation of what the building can look like. Is there a reason why, so I'm a little concerned that if we vote, there's no educa necessary educational use the town votes in on town meeting day and the result is to not take ownership have we painted ourselves into a corner no nope. there's there's nothing prescribed that we have to do we can continue at to that point we can yeah, continue we can keep, the to, vote, to keep the vote in as long as we want we could sell it to another owner um, and from what i understand yeah. the select board could still say we'll take it anyway yeah even if there's a even if the town doesn't vote yeah. in favor of taking the building but so it seems like there's still lots of options on the table even after town meeting yeah. day and it's a good clarifying question yeah yes it is a good clarifying question but we know we are not we are not obligated to say seek and to seek another seller to block all the building we could continue to use it 
Yeah, except we've, again, my concern would be we, we've on record said there's no necessary educational use. For the operation of the district. For the, for the district. Then we come back and say, well, yeah, how do we justify continuing to fund the Absolutely. building and if there's no necessary educational use? And we're still holding on to it? Yeah. Because there might be a desirable educational use, even if it's yeah. not necessary. Yeah, saying that it's not necessary, I think, doesn't yeah. mean that it wouldn't be beneficial. Um, and also, I think there are a lot more factors at play here than just whether or not the educational use of the building is necessary. I mean, I know that's what the law says, and I wouldn't want to go against that, but um, we're clearly taking into account the possible uses and the desires of the Roxbury community, as I think we should. Um, so it's not that that's a pure formality, and I do understand your concern, but I mean, from my understanding of the law, it, making this decision would not prevent us from using the building if Roxbury decides not to purchase it. And however, Roxbury can't take the building without a vote from you first. Yeah. yeah. Not, they yeah, can't take it, but it's not you, but yeah. the board. Yeah. And also, in terms of, I do appreciate the desire to have a thorough and thoughtful process. Um, but I think that when we think about like taking our time, it's possible to take too much time because um, the time that we use is time that the town of Roxbury doesn't have to plan for the use of the, this building and to put into effect the wonderful pl plans that we've had presented to us for its community use. I mean, that's not what the board chair just said. Right, the board chair just said that there's nothing time dependent in the at the child care offer, and then also said that the farm and school, farm and wilderness school, um, yeah. I just, I'm a little. I there's a lot of people giving legal advice tonight, and I'm not cons I'm not necessarily sure that it's that easy, and I just I feel like. Voting right now puts us in a situation that that limits our future options, particularly around bridges. I I would hate to do something today that then precludes bridges from continuing next year. Right. Question: Is bridges considered an educational use? Yes. Yes. So you're saying that. There's no use for bridges. No, no, that's not. What we're no, saying. it's it's a necessary education. I mean, yeah. The way I there's a lot of things in the school that are beneficial uses that I think you could probably say are are not necessarily necessary. The way that I read and understand the necessary use for the district is: could the district function without it, yeah. with the out the actual building? And the answer to that, in my mind, is yes. The district can function without it. That doesn't necessarily mean we would say, oh, therefore we shouldn't have bridges. I think we can do, I do believe we can do both. Say we have no necessary use for the building in order for the district to function and continue offering an enrichment program in that building. As long as we want. Possible, for as long as we want. Yeah. Assume, yeah. Well, and you know, for as long yeah. as we want to, to do that. Yeah. Um, well, Sorry, I what Lynn just said, you know, if we if we no longer own the building, it's not about how long we want to offer it, it's how long the owner of that building wants us to continue. Which would be the which would arguably be the town. So it'd be a it would be a Roxbury community choice about whether or not they wanted to continue that program, not a district choice. And I, I think part of what we want to do here is give Roxbury back control of that building so they can continue the vision for it and they have several visions for it that that suits the town. I think they want to make some plans and yeah we meet every two weeks and I don't want to push this down a month or something. Sounds right. Yeah, right. Um 
I think a, 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 there's a great deal of fear that somehow this opportunity will fall through and that the district will end up selling the building to a developer. That's on one hand. On another, another fear, I think, is um, that immediately the town will be will be kind of on the hook for I don't know what the cost of maintenance for a year is without an adequate plan to have revenue. And so I wonder if if some of this is dependent on a vote in March, by that point, you know, we've cooked our budget. If the cost of maintenance of the building will be in the budget for this year so that this transaction can occur, because I'm not sure. I, I, I want this to be a vibrant community center for our community. There's a lot of energy, um, but there may be a need for Roxbury to, to come up with a, a town, another town position, for instance, to administrate over the building, to, to, to maintain leases and to meet people's needs. There may be a need to establish an insurance um, policy so that they can lease the building. There are a lot of factors I think that are, that can that can make that can prolong. In addition to the March vote, there are a lot of other factors that I that that um, that I worry about. Like it may not it may be that without the right insurance policy, the town can't rent the um, the building to anyone anyway. Um, that's a possibility. I just don't know all the factors, and so that that question of the of whether or not because we have this slight uncertainty about the vote, whether the cost of maintaining the building for this additional year would remain in our budget. Um, well, this process plays out because it does feel like it could take some time to establish oh, you're revenue asking whether or not we would need Roxbury Village School maintenance in the budget. Yes, for, for this additional year. I think we don't. Our legal team told us that this, and Regardless of what you, if you vote tonight, the board votes tonight, that to offer the building back to Roxbury, a real estate transaction takes a considerable amount of time. And this is what it is, a real estate transaction at that point. And therefore we know because we want that building to be maintained in the way that it is now, we are already planning for that to be in our budget because it, a real estate transaction takes a considerable amount of time. And that this has all been said in meetings, but there's been, I really feel like it's really important that this board really states that clearly both to, to both communities, because I know that there are folks in Montpelier that really don't want to continue to pay for the maintenance of the building, but the transaction takes time yep. and yep. to get it into the hands of Roxbury and for Roxbury to be able to, to administrate that building and to, and to find revenue sources for that building, that process I think will also take some time, which we, we certainly have time if it goes until, you know, next budget season. I think that's a lot of time. And it's been a long time with a lot of uncertainty with a, us trying to figure out educational use. You know, I, I was worried about arguing that Bridges is educational use, but I love the idea that it's the same educational use as our athletic programs in our in our high school and our enrichment programs at the middle school. It's it's the kind of enrichment that a, a well-rounded school system provides to students and families. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're required to keep it uh, as, a, as a piece of property in the district. Yeah, I'd just so, like to say one thing, and that is, I appreciate what you're saying, Brett, or Rhett, but the problem is that unless somebody makes a decision, none of this can go forward. And okay? Kind of, yeah. None of this can go forward. Basis. You can you there can conjecture, of, you can chase yourself around in a circle from now until and you can be impatient over. with every public entity that you have to work with. Do you have a question? I do. Um, I'm not sure what a considerable amount of time means. We have seven months still on this budget covering the Roxbury cost. Okay. So is it going to take a year and a half for this to go through? Or? Well, I want you to think about when you've sold a house. Right, like that would be my experience here in selling a building. It's when I've sold a home, right? And that's a house. We're talking about a school building. Um, so I would imagine that lawyers would have to get together to make a contract of exactly when the money would stop from the district and when the town of Roxbury would be, that would be part of the negotiation 
just like when I sold my house, part of the negotiation was what I was going to fix and what I wasn't going to fix as part of the sale. So there's a, and a school building is considerably bigger than a house. So that negotiation between our lawyer, our legal team and the town of Roxbury's legal team, should the board decide to vote to send it back to Roxbury or offer it back to Roxbury, takes time to do. Yeah, also, also just yeah. before Jill, the, yeah, the sooner we begin, the sooner- Our legal be, teams can start. The sooner we can start, the sooner it can be finalized. And you know, if we budget for, you know, you're right, we have seven months left. If we budget for another year, if that transfer, for it takes place earlier, you know, we can either recapture those funds, we can work out some sort of a deal with Roxbury. You know, if if it's not in the budget, then we have to pull from somewhere if if the deal takes longer. I would suspect if, you know, as, as long as Roxbury says yes, that if we started working on this soon, it would not take a year and a half. But I could be wrong. Joe. Yeah, I, I just really think it's important that we move and be clear about our intention. I don't see us changing our mind about the use of the building. And so I think the sooner we can signal to the community um, and the sooner we are not micromanaging or trying to, you know, determine or make decisions about what they do with it after that, I, I feel like we're getting way further past. We are a school board responsible for the school district and the students and the buildings in that district. I think it's pretty clear. I'm, you know, we're all still like, recovering from the really hard decision to close the elementary school. So the idea of keeping the building or like sort of perpetuating the uncertainty um, when we've already had to make that really terrible decision and we're going into another challenging budget year, I don't see any benefit to continuing to sort of prolong the um, uncertainty. And I think there's a lot of benefit to providing certainty, especially since we're hearing pretty universally, the timeline is a little different, but there's clearly very much interest in that community in using this building from the select board, from the community, from private entities. So like, it doesn't seem like we need to, we need to concern ourselves or try to micromanage what happens with it. I feel very strongly that we need to be like really clear to the community. Absolutely. So that they know what they can plan for. That's my two cents. Yeah. And then I just also wanted to add that from a um, deliberative um, point of view, we tried to do a great deal of due diligence in considering what options we could have used the building for and, and left a lot of space for questions from the board, questions from the community, input from the community. And I, I believe that it's important to make a decision thoughtfully, absolutely. And I also don't think that we can expect to know like all the answers before yeah. we make a decision. There are just sometimes unknowns that we have to be able to um, say with faith and understanding and some like, you know, continuation of um, community activity uh, that, it, things will work themselves out. And so in, in my mind, I think we have done enough of the deliberations and enough of the due diligence to know that this is the this is the best possible path forward for our entire community, which yeah. is to um, make this finding and then which kicks off our um, ability to offer it to the town. Yeah. Um, and then just because I have the floor, I also wanna just say to, the three of you who are here representing all the, you know, so many people in your community, how I'm so very impressed I am with the capital A activism that we've seen from Roxbury and how um, just so, I'm just so um, blown away by the amount of effort and time and work that you have put into to creating a vision and to, to continuing to try and see it through. So I just wanted to say, bravo. Yeah, no, yeah, no, I, I echo all of that. And I just, I just want to read it. I think it's just, I think it's fair for us to make clear our intent to the town of Roxbury um, and not kind of add to any speculation that the district may keep the building, it may not keep the building. Yeah, because after that, it's our, you know, it's yeah, on us. after that, it will be, it's on it's, us. It's, yeah. Um, I'm inclined to call a vote unless there's further comments. I think I'm. Probably vote no on it. I think that the uh, after school programs are really a necessary part of our um, academic offerings, our educational offerings in this district. 
And I think it would be a really good idea to um, negotiate a little bit more directly with the town. Um, today, I think we heard a lot about letters that we haven't seen about different positions of insurance companies, about different ideas. I, I really, I'm, I'm not sure I could follow all of it, to be honest. Um, I very much support moving forward uh, with discussions with Roxbury to find a solution that works for both towns. I think a direct engagement with our chair and the select board chair to find that solution, whether that be, you know, some kind of uh, opportunity for us to continue the bridges program in a Roxbury owned town um, would be a wise use of, of time. And I think that the a vote today doesn't give us the opportunity to offer it. It commits us to it. And it it kind of, we're, we're committed to a, a path now. And I'm, I'm not sure I even understand like what the terms of the offer would be. Um, I recognize that there's uh, one of those terms would be a dollar. Um, uh, about the after school program that you, you didn't get a chance to look at this, but there is space there for the, for the after school program and people want it. So it's not, I, you know, we put in space for the town, space for after school, space for the Vermont Farm and Forest, and also Little Sunshine, which is a preschool full day and meets a need that the communities all around need because there's not enough child care for full day. Yeah. So you're you're serving many places by voting yes. Anybody else have questions? No. I mean, Pippa, are you saying you you're, you're worried that if the town owned it they would end the bridges program? No, we that's not no idea. <laughs> um it seems very, very unlikely. So you said it seems quite very, very unlikely to me. It's a hugely popular program. Joe. Um, just a little brief reminder of the history is that when we were first deliberating as a board like a year ago, maybe less than a year ago, about closing the school, a lot of people came to us and asked us for more time and more time and more time, and we really weren't able to do that. And so now in less than half a year, folks have come up with like a very passionate, supported plan. And then we are considering saying, well, now we don't like that feels very disingenuous when, when I think they've actually come back the community has has rallied and has a plan, you know. So I don't we often talk to folk come, but you know, the jerking around it does feel like if we don't, you know, we've we've gone through the process. We were not able to give more time last year, even if it's an informal, like it's a vote that we know that this is our intent. I I think we owe it to the community to signal that. Thank you. I think the select board in Roxbury can't start the process of understanding what it looks like to take ownership until the this this entity says we don't have a necessary educational use, which we already agree the enrichment program is a wonderful thing that I think we all support that we can continue to support and could potentially, it's been discussed, pay to lease space. And the select board has said, of all the things that have been offered, that's the one thing that really, really, we absolutely know is 100% go. Because all of this is wonderful, but there are timelines and there are factors and there are things that might, but none of that can be determined unless the select board has a yes, where we, we want to sell it back. If we control it, we can't, we can't the select board can't, can't, can't maneuver because we can't sign leases. That's what they're saying. And I think we can signal that, that we really want to engage in this. I really think we can. Yeah. We don't all have yeah, to agree. Don't, I, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah, Jim yeah. disagrees with us. Yeah. I, 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 I think it's wrong, voice. but that's okay. So, Tim and I have disagreed before and we probably will again. <laughs> yes, I think we have complied with Robert's rules and had ample discussion. I'm gonna call a vote. Um, since it seems like there is probably not unanimity 
Um, and that's formality. We're we're literally quoting the motion is literally quoting from the original merger agreement yes. that makes the first step is yeah. that this board yeah. makes the determination they're not able to use that for educational purposes that particular building as part of the district, and then is there a second? Okay, there was a second. Jake seconded. Okay. okay. Um, Oh, are you asking? Just and then I was wondering if there was a second motion. Ahead, yeah. But I'll wait no, until we no. get this. Oh, okay. <laughs> so there's there's a second on the motion. Um, so I'll take a vote on the motion. I'll say aye. I also raise your hand so I can do a vote count. Okay, state the motion. Yeah, the motion is to, that we find there is no necessary educational use for the function of the district. Okay. okay. It doesn't have anything to do with the part that says sell it back to for a dollar. There's no. that's a, that's, that's, a, that's, that's triggered not automatically. the motion, but then yeah. that yeah. what happens after. Yeah. That's yeah. The question is what I want to So all those in favor, say aye and raise your aye, hand. Aye. Okay. So it's two, 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 one. I'm going to vote as well. So that will be two. All those opposed. So the eyes have it by a 11 to 4 margin. Thank you. Thank you so much for your hard work. Thank, Thank you, you for your patience. Thanks. Yes, you're, yeah. You know, it all plays out. Keep it up. Yes. Right. So next. Um, <laughs> Community engagement. Anna. Anna and the flesh. Okay. In the flesh. How does it feel to be Good. It also feels good to be under a blanket watching you all on TV, yeah. but it feels great to be here. Thank you for having me. All right. Thank you. I did not print this. Um, apologize. All right. So, oh, what a discussion to follow. Um, so, I am Anna Hipko. I'm our executive assistant to Libby and our communications coordinator for the district. It's nice to see you all in person. Um, so, I'll try to be brief since we're at 840 already. Um, communications and engagement around the budget. So, None of this, I presume, will be new to you in terms of what is a communications and engagement plan, but here's how I think about it. I think about it in two buckets. What's our strategy, the context for why we're doing it, the main messages, elevator speeches, and timeline, and then the implementation of it. Who are our target, our target audiences? Who are the messages that help spread our main mess messengers, who help spread that message? And how? What are our communication, cha communication channels? And then the tangibles are things like flyers and videos and posters and all the pretty stuff. And the feedback is how do we know what we're doing, that we are executing the strategy that we have worked on. So that's how I think about things. Um, this is a total draft strategy, and I'm happy to continue this discussion after, after you have a time to um, review this. But from my perspective, the context is that we want all to have input and as to what, in, what, is, what is not prioritized in a budget and that we want all to understand how and why decisions were made. Um, from my perspective, the main messages that I've heard through past budget seasons and as you work through your um, indicators for success um, are share our successes to show the impact of your tax dollars. That's easy to do. We have got a lot of great things going on here in our school district, so let's share that to communicate what you're voting on. Simplify the complex budget process and drill, drill down to individual impact when possible. Um, it's incredibly complex and got even more complex with LTWADM last year, um, as we're all familiar. Um, seek and consider the voice of the community by offering intentional and equitable opportunities to learn and engage. Um, I think this is where a lot of the implementation comes in and then approve a proposed budget that reflects the voice of the community that we've heard considers the impact of on taxpayers, both for the factors in our control and outside of our control, and then ensures funding to support the priorities that we defined at the last meeting and that we'll continue to define. So 
for timeline, I think about it in two phases. First, inform and engage now until January 22nd, when the timeline says is our last draft and we need to approve the warning. And January 22nd to March 4th, town meeting day, where we're more on the inform and vote campaign side of it. So implementation, the, the who. So target audiences, budget communications is kind of all, all things at it. So a lot of this is going to be utilize all channels, all target audiences. Not all of our communications plans are that, of course, uh, but all. Internal staff, students, caregivers, external communities in Montpelier and Roxbury. Our messengers, our primary messengers are the school board and our administration. And our informal kind of messengers are all of our target audiences, all of our partners. Everyone can be a messenger if we communicate effectively. Um, so we'll dive into groups a little bit later, but I want to ask, I have some big green questions throughout my presentation that are kind of questions for the board. And in thinking about our target audiences and strategy, I wanted to give you an insight into some voter data that I looked at. So I apologize, this is so small. Um, so budget history, we saw this last presentation. This was the slide deck from the previous presentation where we saw past budgets, the tax rates, overall percentage. And so I expanded that a little bit further to look at what was the date of the vote, how many voters voted yes and no in each town, how did how by how much did it pass or not, um, what were some factors in various years that we might want to consider, um, and then some statistics, um, average turnout between 2019 and 2025. Uh, between towns and average voter uh, of those voters who voted yes on town meeting day. And for this second little bucket, I excluded 2025 just to see if last year's um, budget season um, swayed things a little bit because it was much more complex and the tax rates were predicted to be so much higher. So um, I think you will see that I found that it um, more Montpelier voters voted uh, the average Montpelier voters voting yes increased when we excluded last year, was higher when we excluded last year, and between Roxbury was about the same voting yes across all of those years. Um, turnout was pretty similar. Um, looking further at voter data, so we can pull the, um, I don't think they're called the grand list, but we can see who the registered voters are in every town, when they voted, obviously not how they voted, but when and how they voted. Um, in person or by via absentee ballot. So some of this I would hope informs our strategy. Um, just to call out some highlights here, I and a caveat to this, I was unable to obtain um, all of the voter records from Roxbury, but I hope to do so and I'll add that in here at that time. But if we're looking just at Rox at Montpelier for the March town meeting day vote and the April, second April vote, I'm sorry, this is so small up there. Um, 45% of active registered voters um, in Montpelier voted on town meeting day. So less than half of the registered voters voted on town meeting day. 25% voted in April, so even less. 26% um, voted via absentee ballot on town for town meeting day, 36% for April. So I think this is telling us part of our strategy might be your vote matters, encouraging people to vote. There's a pretty good registered to vote a uh, percentage, but only half are. So your vote matters, get out there and vote. And for ourselves, communicate early because a, a good chunk is voting via absentee ballot. Um, um, yeah, go ahead. Just a really quick clarification. So the column that you have, column E that you've got highlighted, yep. that's all the votes, of all the votes cast the it was only 45% of, of registered voters. And then of that 45%, 26% um, of them were absentee. So it's Correct. not 26% of all right. registered Even voters. It's only yep, yep. Thank 45, you. yep, 26% of the 45% who voted, voted the absentee, same, same here and here. Um, and then comparing March to April overall, 45% uh, less of the registered voters voted, excuse me, yes, 45% less people voted overall on the second vote. Um, so keep those numbers in the back of your mind. Um, and then we can further dive into this data if we'd like to. We have the names. We could identify 
out of our target, some of our target audiences, caregiver, staff, and students, how, what percentage of our caregivers voted? What percentage voted on town meeting day versus April? How many did so via absentee ballot? Um, how many didn't vote on town meeting day who did vote in April? Was there any igniting of folks who might've thought it's okay on town meeting day and then, oh no, I really, my voice does matter. I need to vote in April. I think all those would be incredibly insightful and we have our lists and we have the grand list. So let's do some comparison and find out if there's more strategy there. Um, and then I was also thinking, can we compare that to who voted in this past presidential election, just to see how big turnout shifts when we're talking about national versus a local election. Um, so that's my quick glimpse into my deep dive of voter uh, turnout and strategy. Um, communication channels, the how. So I think of them in three buckets, digital, print, and events. And the channels for digital are pretty straightforward, social media, front porch forum, district and mass messaging, that's our parent square, um, and our website, landing pages, that kind of thing. Print, newspapers, mass mailings to our school community or to the wider community, we could utilize the post office and a postcard to everybody in every town, an option. Or canvassing, equipping our teachers, schools, public places, posting posters, flyers, that kind of thing. And then events, one-on-one -on -one or group events, tabling, coffee chats, you get the examples. And then tangibles are the thing that I think some folks jump to first when thinking about communications. I think of them last. What are they supporting? And um, so tangibles, examples, infographics, videos, podcasts, letters to the editor. Yeah, I mean, you know all the examples, but those are everything in our wheelhouse that we've done before and can do again and expand upon. Um, and of course, when we think about tangibles too, there's one of me and so many of you, we have to make them doable to execute, right? Um, and they can be used cross events. A digital asset can be printed or optimized to hand out at an event. If we're not recreating every tangible for every channel. Um, further thinking about tangibles, I wanna highlight that we will always follow the rules of print and digital accessibility. Um, I've linked a little presentation I did for our administrators here that you're welcome to look at, but that's things like alt text and captions on videos and just ensuring that anybody accessing our uh, materials has the ability to read it, listen to it, interpret it, however they so need to. And they'll be optimized and utilized across different channels to what I was talking about before. We're not creating a ton of stuff. So some visuals of what that fun stuff might look like. I created this little logo this morning. This is all draft, but how are we really gonna define that it's budget season, this is something to pay attention to and make it look connected to our district. So this was my little fun thing this morning. Um, I uh, wanna put a QR code on anything we do print so anybody can scan that QR code and go to our budget landing page. And that budget landing page I propose is our home base for everything that we do. And we're funneling people there all the time because we have options to update that and you get that. Um, but this is another example of how assets look very similar across the board. Um, we might hand out, excuse me, uh, hand out a flyer um, at the table. This might be what we post on our social media or continued. Um, and then that feedback step, of the, of the implementation phase. Um, engagement metrics, we've got a lot of digital metrics at our fingertips, our, our web traffic, our social media engagement. Um, Parent Square has a lot of analytics into who opens, clicks, reads all of our newsletters. Um, we can really go really deep with all of that. Um, and then events, I would propose that we do a simple report form that the host of the event could say who attended, what was the anecdotal sort of feedback tracked, and in that way we can see, are we being successful at attracting attendance to our events and was it a successful event? Um, and then feedback, of course, from our target audiences on our landing page and that QR code that will link to it and anything we put out, I propose we send a quick pulse survey. What are we not answering? What are you still wondering about? Um, so that we can continue to beef up our FAQ documents and communicate what's still not clear um, in real time. Um, and anecdotal, we get a ton of it to board members, to all of our staff, from porch forum post responses, of course, emails to the school board at, um, and then from our community partners too. Um, 
this is just a quick screenshot. I know it's really small, but it shows uh, the day before the April 30th vote, we had 150 visitors to our budget webpage, which was the most ever. Um, this tracks around two to three people a day on the average uh, timeline. So we can compare last budget season, December to May, to this budget season, see if we did a good job at increasing traffic to that landing page. Go Where's for it. Uh, town meeting day on that timeline? Town meeting day is right around here. Oops, excuse me, sorry. And we'll put there. Um, and then this document, don't get overwhelmed, but uh, I started to list the groups who we have connections with already, who we might be missing. Um, we've got a lot of community partners already. We've got our caregivers alliances. Um, we're, uh, we've got our town representatives, um, lots of different groups. We've got in Roxbury and Montpelier, uh, root, the Roxbury Roots, Roxbury Rising, um, lots of locations, businesses, free libraries, all those great places. I think we really need to strategically uh, connect with those groups and, and host events or canvas at their locations, or, um, do things to intentionally connect with all of the places that our target audience, everybody, uh, patrons, visitors, engage with, engages with, excuse me. Um, and then this fun document that is going to look very small, is a list of everything that's gonna happen between now, November 20th, and March 4th town meeting day. And this was Libby and I's way of thinking about what events do we know is, everything in yellow is kind of draft, and then everything in white we know is happening. We know we're sending school newsletters every week from our principals. There's going to be a standing budget area in those newsletters from here until March. Uh, we do the front porch forum posts. We started the synopses last time, doing a summary of each board meeting on front porch forum, in addition to warning the meeting on front porch forum. Um, I put things on here like um, in the draft areas, um, host more staff forums, um, uh, additional print things, maybe tabling at some of those businesses we looked at previously. Uh, hosting more community forums at senior centers, other meeting, others meetings and events, um, all that kind of stuff. I even asked Matt Link about like what's going to be the most popular basketball game this winter before town meeting day. So that's on here too. We should have a table there. We should have something there, right? Um, so yeah, so that's how I thought about it. And then how does this mean? And for looking at numbers, so I gave one is. Engage. One is we reach them. So the, here's target audiences in these columns. Um, zero is that event, that channel doesn't reach them historically. Um, what supports did we offer? Do we see an uptick in attendance if we offer childcare and food? Do we not? Do we wanna make ensure that we have at least three of those offerings in, during budget season to trial that? Um, and then are we offering that feedback survey or some sort of option to give feedback? Um, so when I thought about it that way, it produces some some totals that I think we can discuss. Um, and in terms of engagement, is there direct opportunity to discuss and give feedback? I would consider public comment an engagement opportunity, a community forum an engagement opportunity. A social media post, though, is not an engagement opportunity. We're informing by way of making that post. Um, so that's that column. Um, so with what we've had listed, I... I think you'll see we've got lots of opportunities to learn, lots of opportunities to engage, and maybe we want to increase that as we think about some of these more drafty things over here. Who who have we not done a great job at reaching historically um, and want to be more strategic about this year? Um, but the moral of the story that I want to get at is we are going to reach all of our target audiences. Uh, we are going to offer supports. We're going to request feedback, and we're going to continually tweak this as we go. Uh, to ensure that we're reaching our goal. Um, back. Um, so that's my presentation. I know that leaves a lot open for discussion. Um, where do you all wanna get involved? Um, I have some ideas, but open my bed. Well, first off, it's fantastic. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, a lot of hard work and just really informative. It's really good. good. I do a lot of, of comms in my non 
Wednesday night job. Uh, and like having this type of data just about how to target people and what they, you know, what they react to, where they are, it's super helpful to, to getting messages out and connecting with people. So um, this is really, really good. And I will open up a discussion and I kind of just as a open thing or as a invitation for the board, I think we should all probably try to think of like two or three things we can all do during this process, you know, to to engage, uh, you know, a table at, at the basketball game or, um, you know, meeting meeting with the senior center or something of that nature. Because I think if we team up and do that, that'll increase our touches. So I'll like, open up to questions and also thank you for staying late. In addition to some, just before we open them, in addition to some of those events and tabling type things, I'd also like to expand to think about like, do we want to identify uh, Friends of Montpelier School's Facebook page sort of uh, school board rep who might share all the things from our district yeah. onto that page. Something simple, digit, not totally simple, but digital, yeah. so it doesn't require too much time. Um, Jim has a government front porch form account that is our school board front porch form account. Libby and the district have one as well, so how do we want to utilize those differently? Um, yeah, so I think I think how you can be involved is beyond just events and physical presence in places. Uh, it, it immediately occurred to me our table at the basketball game won't be very close to the court, um, but, no. No. <laughs> but, but, but places where my kids would have social, you know, to have cultural and social opportunities are places where I would be happy to you know, the, the, those types of events where I'm at a table somewhere and my kids are not too far, but, you know, Oxford, having, Oxford, a, well, yeah. just, and having experiences that they won't have at all. I mean, which we're trying to do all the time, but coming to concerts here, um, you know, anything here that we would go to anyway, I'll miss seeing the show, but like, I'm there for my kids' experience, and I could be at a table. You know, that's that type of thing would re, would appeal to me for sure. Great. Yeah. A, lo a lot of what you shared with us, it felt like was the like getting the message out. What what were the things were the opportunities for like sitting it getting getting input in? Yeah, I, so I just didn't you, see them. Yeah, if we look at the calendar again, so there's school board meeting. So yeah um let's see everything before january 22nd so things that i counted as engagement opportunities would of course be the board meetings um coffee and chats with libby those are happening monthly in both montpelier and roxbury um caregiver council meetings happening at district level and uh, school level mm -hmm. anybody is welcome to reach out to the principals or libby to join those um, there are groups established um, but all are welcome uh caregiver councils let's see some other ones um we had community forums in there too yeah and then we had thought about some additional community forums that we might have not done before um jess murray has her strategic anti-racism and equity plan community night coming up that's that's one um uh, let's see we were talking uh, about ramping it up so so in december having um, slightly less kind of push and advocacy and then ramping up the advocacy in January, sure. February. That you makes know? sense. Yeah. But we also want to get, yeah, I, I mean, hopefully people know email, yeah. emailing the school board is a way of yeah. way giving us input and um, school board meetings are a way of giving us input. And maybe what we could do is, as we did last year, we would do a budget presentation and then conduct sort of community forum type um setting yeah. um for members of the community to say to give to say oh well you know i don't understand that pie chart or you know can you break that down for me a little bit more or we thought asking of these questions or whatever yeah prior to january 22nd when we're in the draft phase to have input on how the budget is developed exactly. prior to that final vote we libby and i discussed a, a variety of community forums that she and maybe one or two board members would want to join to host um, one in mid-December, an open forum, and we've talked about shifting the time and virtual or in person yep. um, to, you know, 
Uh, so run proposed for December 10th, four to five in person at the high school with a virtual option, January 7th. So this would be uh, actually just before, maybe we changed that around, but a virtual offering similar, but this one's seven to 8 p.m. to try people after bedtime, after dinner. Um, and then another one, like a lunch drop-in, all virtual. Um, so we're kind of thinking sure. about it that way. Uh -huh. Um, and those would all be in, in ahead of the more formal community forums that we would do to say, this is the budget we have Got it. approved and proposed. Amazing. Yeah. Which are warned meetings. Let me do that. Yep. Yep. Um, and, and not only community, but thinking about that in terms of staff as well. Could we tack onto their Monday staff meetings? Uh, can we engage with Kathleen's journalism class to get some students on board? Um, all that kind of thing. But I'm open to more ideas. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, you asked the question, where do board members want to get involved? I would like to help out as much as possible um, in both stages, the gathering information and then the sort of like mobilization to vote stage. Maybe what would be helpful is if there was like a sign up sheet column in here, because yep. then we yeah. could, as, as we get closer to dates and things like that, of when these things are happening, we as board members could be like, oh yeah, put me in there. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's the same thing. As a somewhat precursor to that, I'd love to learn from you all. Who do you who do, what groups do you feel you have connections with that Libby and I might not? Is anybody deeply engaged with the Kellogg Library and their programs? Or is someone on uh, part of Roxbury Roots? Are there other uh sort of big groups that you are engaged with that the, the district might not directly be um that you could help us to kind of reach out to them and establish what are the opportunities there that we could then sign up for? Think about that. Yeah. First one coming to mind is my book club, but <laughs> it's <laughs> Why not? <laughs> the Roxbury's pretty small. I might not be super close with everyone, but like it's pretty small. Yeah. Beyond Roxbury Roots and Rising and Select Board, are there other groups that I might have missed in my There's initial a crafters group? Um there are there. Let me let me reach out. Uh, let me reach out and get back to you because I, I think that there are there are groups that um, we can identify that we could intentionally reach out to, and they would volunteer to. They would tell me. They'll tell me who. Right. Does your town have a monthly conference? Yeah. Have yeah, that's the Roxbury that's Roots. Yeah. Oh, okay. And my my goal with like any of this engagement would be to equip you all, depending on what kind of phase we're at would, with the applicable tangible for that moment, where we at something to hand out, a QR poster to hang, um, a feedback form, paper and a digital through the QR code. So you have those at any given thing that you might volunteer for. In addition, I thought about sending a, a what like weekly or bi-weekly email to the board saying, here's our tangibles, Here's our things coming up next week. Mm. Here's the elevator speech of the, the bi-weekly period that we're in. So anytime you're out in the community, you can, you can say, okay, this is the message that we've all aligned on and are sharing right now. And we are really promoting attendance at the community forum happening two weeks from now. That's our immediate focus. And I think that's where we, I can help shift to equip you all with what you need to confidently go out there. Um, yeah, I love that approach. I think even more so than just like a big checklist or, or of like sign up, yeah. right? Like those biweekly emails with the immediate needs. I can't be on next Tuesday, right? So yeah. like to know what I'm doing in January 28th, you know, who knows? But yeah. but getting those those um tangibles and then like the upcoming opportunities, that's awesome. Cool. Thank you so much. Yeah. This is amazing. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, we will. We will look forward to building on this this work and engaging as we move forward. It's just a huge, huge lift, and we haven't had anything like this before. So it's great. Yeah, I did that. You can't have her. Uh, I, I, thought, I thought we did. No, he's thinking about his own his outside business. Oh, there. Gosh, no, no, no. no. All right. Yeah, that's amazing. The the way like the data and things like that. I had no idea that that was like possible let alone like that you're using that to inform strategy i think that's really cool i'm really impressed cool. so i'm not saying anything because i can't think of anything beyond what you've already addressed here the only thing that came to my mind was students like 
is there like a get out the vote or like do students here know they need to like register when they're 18? Um, yes. That's the only thing that I could think of. And I think you mentioned that, that there's a journalism. Uh, like voter registration drive. But I think that after the presidential election, like I, I don't know how much students know that local elections are a thing that yeah, they need to do because I don't think there's as much um, <laughs> yes. I don't think there's as much publicity around yeah. those as there is around other elections so well, I think let's make we sure that happens yeah, yeah it's really yeah. we were thinking about the TAs and the solo oh, blocks yeah. that yeah. you all have and use uh, using those in tandem with Jason to uh and your teachers of course to um teach you how to register to vote mm -hmm. if you are registered here's why it's important to vote it's a good life skill mm -hmm. yeah Mm -hmm. Okay. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you for staying late. I know that. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much, Anna. You grew it off course. Well, I didn't grow off course. <laughs> um, so pretending we're in Chicago, we're actually kind of on time. But uh, <laughs> so. Midwest, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Central time. It's central time, exactly. Um, do you have a motion to approve three policy monitors reports? B6, the electronic communications between employees and students, C3, transportation, and B1, substitute teachers. I will be approved. I'll second. Policy <laughs> You'll second. Uh, any, any discussion or questions about the monitor reports? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Monitor reports passed. Uh, now I have a motion to move to executive session. Um, Anna has conveniently provided the language, but if not, I can read it and so can make the motion. Can I add on uh, contract negotiations for that very briefly? Sure. Yeah. It is on the uh, agenda for the next. Oh, except there's a there's a finding we need. It's premature general public knowledge. Premature general public knowledge that would put the district at a substantial disadvantage. There you go. So if there's someone want to make a motion that says what Anna and I just <laughs> pasted together. I will what Anna and Jim just said. <laughs> so second. I'll second that. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. So, uh, so now, now I we move need. that we enter into executive session for the purpose of discussing the contract of the superintendent under the provisions of Title I, Section 313A3 of Vermont Statutes. And contract negotiations. And contract negotiations. Do you have a second? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. 